Good evening and welcome from the National Archives in Washington, D.C. Um, I am Brianne Robertson. I'm an education specialist with the National Archives Museum. I am joined this evening by National Archives volunteer and former Holocaust Museum teacher fellow, Cynthia Peterman, and United States Holocaust Memorial Museum educators, Christina Chavarria and Eric Schmaltz. We want this session to be as interactive as possible. You will have two ways to participate. You can use the Q&A at any time to ask a question or share a comment, and you can participate in the polls that will pop up during our presentation. So let's get started. We'd love to know where you're watching from. Please take a moment to share your location in the Q&A box. So I listed a few already. I'll mention a few more as they come in, but we'll go ahead and get into our program. With the 2024 Paris Summer Olympics just a few months away, we're excited to take this opportunity to reflect upon an earlier Olympic meeting, which took place in Berlin, Germany, under the Nazi regime of Adolf Hitler in 1936. Responding to reports alleging human rights violations against Jewish people in Germany, a variety of stakeholders, including American athletes, Olympic organizers, government officials, and the general public, debated whether the United States should boycott the event. Some argue that going forward with the Games would show support for Hitler and the Nazi government whose policies of discrimination, they argued, were against the Olympic ideal. Others argued that politics had no place in sport and boycotting the games would deprive athletes of an opportunity to represent their country and compete for a medal in their sport. Tonight, we will discuss resources and strategies for teaching about this difficult history. We're honored to partner with the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum to provide historical context for the boycott debate and to introduce ready-to-use teaching materials from the exhibit Americans in the Holocaust and from History Unfolded and Docs Teach catalogs of records and activities. First, we'll hear from Christina Chavarria and Eric Schmaltz, Program Coordinators for Education Initiatives at the Museum's Levine Institute for Holocaust Education. Christina and Eric, over to you. Well, thank you so much um, for, for inviting us to be a part of this webinar. I just wanna tell you a little bit about the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We are located on the National Mall and we are the nation's living memorial to the Holocaust that inspires citizens worldwide to confront hatred, prevent genocide, and promote human dignity. Through our William Levine Family Institute for Holocaust Education, we are the global leader in advancing the relevance of the Holocaust to new generations. And we are also a trusted provider of quality Holocaust educational resources to school administrators and teachers. The museum has created an online exhibition. We've created several actually, but in this case, we have created an online exhibition and resources around the 1936 Summer Olympic Games that were held in Berlin. Um, joining me here today, as, as Cynthia and Brianne mentioned, is my colleague, Eric, um, who's going to also talk about the resources that we have. So Eric, Tell us a little bit about the resources that the museum has that can provide the historical content and context on the 1936 Olympic Games. The Holocaust Encyclopedia articles provide historical content and context about Americans' attitudes towards participating in the 1936 Berlin Olympic Games. Articles in the Holocaust Encyclopedia include a brief overview, key facts, photos, and videos. This article about the movement to boycott the Berlin Olympics of 1936 contains critical thinking questions you can use with your students. Christina 
Now that we know a little bit more about one of the resources available, could you tell us a little bit about Americans' attitudes towards Germany hosting the Olympics? Sure, Eric. Um, this is an excellent question. And our online resources around a theme called Americans in the Holocaust includes public opinion polls that were taken in the 1930s and 1940s. And these public opinion polls reflect the mood and the attitudes that Americans had toward what was happening in Nazi Germany. So for historical context around the opinion poll that we're looking at, in 1931, Germany was awarded both the Summer and the Winter Olympic Games and for 1936. So they were both held in Berlin. But as persecution of German Jews and other groups escalated ahead of the Olympic Games, various American individuals and organizations called for a boycott of the Games. So this opinion poll that we see here that's taken in 1935, over a year before the Games took place, asked Americans the questions that we see, the question that we see here. And you can see the response. About 57% of Americans polled felt that the US should not boycott the games. And prominent figures such as Avery Brundage, who was the head of the US Olympic Committee at the time, also felt that the US should compete in the Olympic games. Thank you, Christina, for that explanation. Sure. To understand how and why the Holocaust happened, we have to understand the role of anti-Semitism. But before we do that, how do we define anti-Semitism? How did anti-Semitism play a role in some athlete's decision to boycott the Olympics? Eric, thank you for asking that question. It's, it's especially critical today that, that we understand the definition of anti-Semitism. So anti-Semitism is defined as prejudice against or hatred of Jews. Athletes, particularly, particularly American Jewish athletes at the time, they had different responses to anti-Semitism and it influenced their decisions in different ways, whether they decided to participate in the Olympic games or not participate. Um, the museum has so many primary source documents for you to use in your classroom um, and to help your students think critically about history. And one of the primary source documents that's included in our online exhibition on the uh, Nazi Olympics, Berlin 1936, um, includes oral testimonies. So right now we're going to listen to the oral testimony of Milton Green. Um, before we listen, let me just tell you a little bit about Milton Green. He was a young American Jewish athlete who was training to compete in the Olympics. And he was facing certain pressures. So as you listen to his testimony, think about the pressure that he faces and from whom, and think about in the influence of his response to the pressure. And then we are going to put a question um, right now in the chat. And as you're listening to his oral testimony, um, think about your response and please feel free to answer your response to this question. What role does anti-Semitism play in Milton Green's decision, um, his decision whether to whether he's going to participate or boycott? So um, let's go on ahead and listen to his testimony. Um, the online exhibition also has some testimonies from Black American athletes as well. Um, and it also has political cartoons and other primary sources. And we also provide the historical context. So whenever um, you're ready, whenever it's working, Brianne, thank you. And just also to note, we also have the, the transcript of his oral testimony as well. If students would like to read along with it, um, that's also very helpful for them, too. I was always interested in athletics. And uh, I knew that I was uh, a pretty good athlete. I was captain of 
of all the track teams since I was in grammar school. I'd been always thinking and wanting to be in the Olympics. Of course, that was my hope to be in the Olympics. I had held the world's record in the high hurdles and uh, also the Harvard Yale record in the broad jump. And I was watching the performances all over the world. I knew that I'd qualified because uh, uh, I won the, the preliminary events. There was some publicity in the Boston papers about my roommate and me, Norman Connors. It was a picture of us winning uh, six gold medals. In the Harvard Yale track meet, Rabbi Levy was the head of the Temple Israel in Boston, a reformed temple, and he was well respected all over the United States. And he had seen the publicity and knew that we were potential Olympic candidates and said he'd like to talk to us. I was confirmed at Temple Israel, and uh, naturally when they asked us to come, asked me and Norman, kind of, uh, we agreed to come. I didn't know what they were going to talk about, except that uh, something about the Olympics. They told us about the terrible things that were going on in Germany and the Nazi regime. And it was, it was a shocker to me and Norman. They suggested that uh, it might be a good idea for us not to go to the Olympics because of all this, these problems and to sort of register our objections and uh, sort of boycotting the uh, Olympics. And we were quite taken back about that thought. Uh, and they tried to explain to us that we would never regret if we did take that action to boycott the Olympics. And that meeting really turned us around because uh, we were horrified of well, the terrible things that were going on in Germany. Both Connors and I decided that we would boycott the Olympics. We just felt it was the right thing to do. I spoke to the track coach at Harvard. We told him about our intention. He tried to persuade us not to do it. He said he didn't think it would do much good and that uh, we should try to go to the uh, final tryouts and try to make the, the team. But uh, we didn't uh, want to do that. After we boycotted the Olympics, uh, no one came to speak to us or ask us uh, if we'd uh, make any statements about it. And uh, I don't think uh, anyone knew particularly that we did boycott it. I think back on making that decision and uh, whether I would have won a, <laughs> a silver or gold or some sort of a medal. And every time I go to the Olympics, no, I've been to three of them. Uh, and I watched, I, I particularly watched the high hurdles and the long jump. And uh, I, I picture myself. <laughs> as uh, maybe having won a, a medal on it. Thank you for, for playing that, Brianne. So um, let's just look at the question again. What role does anti-Semitism play <clears throat> in Milton Green's decision? Well, what, what was his decision, first of all? What did he decide to do? Um, and what role did anti-Semitism play in his decision? So um, we're going to look at the um, Q&A. If you want to write your responses in there, that would be great. Thinking about what, what anti-Semitism is and what role it plays in his decision-making. Okay, do we have any responses? I can't see clearly. Let's see in the... Q and A. Um, okay, thank you, Ian. Um, it made him not want to go um, because of the things that are going on in Germany with with German Jews, with the Jewish population. Yes, um, it it plays a role. And think about how that his um, decision. You know, think how young he is. You know, and to realize that this is happening in the world. 
And so in protest, he decides to boycott the games. He decides to not go. Let's see. Um, I think we have um, a couple of other responses. Uh, Taylor, he decided to not go to the Olympics in Germany because of what was going on. And he also tried to boycott the Olympics also to itself. He did not, not only did he not participate, he didn't even attend the games. Um, and nobody really talked to him. Thank you for, for also adding that detail, Taylor. Nobody talked to him after because of um, others not thinking that it, you know, it should have been this way. Because again, you know, we look at the opinion poll and most Americans felt that we should not boycott, which Taylor is, is making light, light of. So, you know, he went against the more popular opinion um, and, you know, without even really thinking what role it would play in his future. So, um, again, you get a, a very personal perspective by listening to his oral testimony. He's, he's Jewish. He's an American. And this is his way of maybe standing with um, his fellow athletes who are Jewish, even if they're from another country. So um, thank you so much for these responses. And, um, and as Brianne also writes, you know, he thought it was the right thing to do um, by boycotting the games um, and not participating. He felt he was doing the right thing. So thank you so much for um, sharing these responses with us. And so um, just looking again at the opinions of American citizens, we've, um, we've done some work on this and some research. And so Eric, tell us what were the opinions of minorities um, regarding the debate to boycott the Olympics and in particular, Jewish American groups and also black Americans? Thank you for that question, Christina. The U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum has collected much evidence about how minorities in the U.S. responded to the Olympics debate. The history unfolded U.S. newspapers in the Holocaust website has over 50,000 primary source articles. Some of these articles show what Americans could have known and how they felt about the 1936 Berlin Olympics. So uh, let's, let's take a look at one of these. Um, Christina, show us an example of one of the primary source articles available in the History Unfolded website. So Eric, we're looking at an example now from the Jewish press, and in particular, a publication called The Jewish Transcript that was published in Seattle, Washington. This political cartoon was published three weeks before the American Olympic Committee voted in favor of the US participating in the Olympic Games. So if you look very closely at this political cartoon, you'll see that one of the figures in the window is German Jewish athlete Gretel Bergman. And if you watch the Behind Every Name video, this video helps students to better analyze and contextualize this cartoon's message. Um, she was not allowed to compete in the games because she was Jewish. Um, so you have these two sources of information. You have this one primary source document and then the animated video that tells her story more fully. You'll also notice that there's a quote at the bottom of the cartoon from Brigadier General Charles H. Sherrill. Um, he was an American diplomat and he was an admirer of Adolf Hitler and you're, you're going to hear more about him. And he actually met Hitler prior to the games to try to persuade Hitler to allow one Jewish athlete on the German Olympic team. So Helene Mayer, a German Jewish fencer, was allowed to compete in the games and you see a figure named for her in the cartoon as well. So based on the cartoon's title, and knowing the background information of each figure in the cartoon, what is the attitude? And you can put your comments, your response to this question in the Q&A. What is the attitude of the Jewish transcript toward the upcoming Berlin Olympic Games? How does the Jewish transcript feel about the upcoming Berlin Olympic Games, according to this political cartoon? So the question's in the chat and, and you can put your response in the Q&A. Okay, so um, 
it's just it's just a friend and uh, ian says this is just a friend and it might not be the same in germany at that time um so yeah window dressing i mean the the title itself says a lot about the attitude of the jewish transcript toward the games it's just it is putting on that front and it yeah it's it's not positive um at all um these aren't going to be goodwill games necessarily the way we often think of the olympic games it's just showing one thing while other things are happening in germany aside from the olympic games thank you so much for your responses you you all are uh, um really strong in in what you're stating about um, the resources. And these are all actual parts of the lesson, the lesson plans that we have, all of the questions that we're asking you. So History Unfolded, the History Unfolded website also contains articles from the Black American Press and a lesson plan that asks students to examine responses to the Holocaust among Black Americans. So Eric, tell us about this letter that appears in the lesson plan. Thank you, Christina. And um, before I do, I just think it's so powerful that we have uh, these documents where we can either hear or see uh, printed uh, the voices of these individuals um, as they're expressing their thoughts. And so um, this is one that really resonates with me. This is a letter printed in the Chicago Defender. Uh, the letter writer, Charles W. Harris of New York City indicates that the Jewish the Jews are being mercilessly persecuted in Germany. Harris argues that participation in the Olympic Games would be an endorsement endorsement of Nazism. The History Unfolded database also includes articles from Black Americans pointing out the hypocrisy of asking Black American athletes to participate in the Olympic Games while they experience racism and discrimination in the United States. We have many other resources available on our website to help teach about the 1936 Berlin Olympics. We've only had uh, an opportunity to share about just uh, some of them right now. We will provide links to uh, these additional resources in a follow-up email. We thank our friends at National Archives for inviting us to participate in this webinar, and now our colleagues at the National Archives will share more of their resources with you. All right, so thanks to um, Christina and Eric for that terrific presentation. I'm showing you here, um, you know, one of those uh, articles from the Chicago Defender um, that could be found on History Unfolded. This evening, Cynthia Peterman and I are going to keep the conversation going by uh, focusing on National Archives materials and strategies for discussing the 1936 Berlin Olympics with your students. Archival records are great primary sources to introduce in your classroom, and there are different methods and depths of analysis on the grade, depending on the grade and the abilities of your students. An important part of teaching this history is to help students understand that sporting events continue to be platforms where athletes and others can call attention to unfair treatment and discrimination, both on the playing field and in the world at large. The 1936 Berlin Olympics is a historical example, but one with important lessons for the struggles we continue facing today. So let's begin with a poll. Do you currently teach with primary sources? So I'll give you just a few seconds to go ahead and put in your answer for us. And it looks like, now some of you are still answering. So it looks like we are split about two thirds. We've got, um, you know, a 
some of you do already um, teach with primary sources, but the majority of you, you don't yet. And so that is exciting because we are going to talk about ways to make you feel more comfortable doing that and to make it feel approachable and accessible for your students. The National Archives holds millions of records that are created or received by the US government during and after World War II that document Nazi war crimes, wartime refugee issues, and activities and investigations of US government agencies involved in the identification and recovery of looted assets, uh, including gold, art, and cultural property as well as captured German records used as evidence at the Nuremberg International Military Tribunals. We not only hold these records, we provide access to them. But the 1936 Berlin Olympics were held several years before the United States entered World War II. What did Americans know about what was happening in Germany and what debates were they having about how the country should respond? Now, when working with students, this is where I usually ask them to help define the Olympic Games. They usually state that it is a global sports competition. And with this shared understanding, we can begin to dig into the role that politics and diplomacy can have in such an event. So how would one go about introducing the boycott debate to a classroom? As with anything, we need a hook. What part could connect with students? What is familiar to them about boycotts? At its basic level, a boycott is a form of protest. Often when a group stops buying goods or cooperating with a policy to express their disapproval. Students may already be familiar with other historic protests, such as the Montgomery bus boycott, which protested forced segregation on public transportation during the civil rights era. The Olympics, though, happen only once every four years and often take place in a foreign country. What would a boycott even look like at an international level? The Olympics are important athletic events in which many different nations come together peacefully and in friendly competition. However, as early as 1933, with preparations underway for the Berlin Olympics, disturbing reports about the German Reich's unfair treatment of Jewish people had reached the United States. These included setting up the first concentration camp at Dachau, boycotting Jewish businesses, barring Jews from professional positions, Some of these reports came from U.S. diplomats stationed in Germany, including George Messer Smith, Consul General in Berlin, who frequently reported to the State Department on the deteriorating situation in Germany. As we've already said, a debate was growing in the U.S. over whether or not to send a team to Berlin. In 1935, Brigadier General C.H. Shirill, whose name appeared in that cartoon that uh, Christina and Eric shared, he was former U.S. Ambassador to Turkey and member of the International Olympic Committee's executive board, met with Adolf Hitler to ask if Germany intended to prevent Jewish athletes from participating in the 36 Berlin Olympics. After his meeting, he wrote a letter to President Franklin D. Roosevelt describing what he believed was a successful meeting to allow Jewish athletes to participate in the games. In a moment, we will explore the letter in some detail. All right, so before we start analyzing this letter, we should take a minute to introduce you to the National Archives Document Analysis Worksheet. Using these classroom ready PDFs will provide you with a tool for organizing your students' work with primary sources and enable you to provide formative assessment as they study. 
The National Archives provides primary source analysis worksheets on the agency website, archives.gov, and on DocsTeach. These printable graphic organizers are available for many types of primary sources and are presented on two levels, novice and advanced. So let's take a look at the worksheet for analyzing a written record, and we have a link for that dropped into the chat. As you can see, this worksheet leads the student through the process of analyzing a primary source document by starting with observations and moving on to increasingly interpretive and open-ended questions. Approaching a primary source in this manner enables students to base their interpretation on a foundation of factual evidence. Over time, applying the process as set out in the worksheet will help them to internalize a methodical approach to analysis that will serve them well when facing other primary sources. So, Cynthia, back to you. Thank you, Brianne. Begin by asking students. Oh, we need to see the, the next page. There we go. Uh, so this is the letter that uh, General Shirell sent to um, President Roosevelt. So begin by asking students, what is the first thing you notice about this letter? Very confidential is handwritten at the top. Why might this letter be considered highly sensitive? When we look at the language here on the first page, we see that Hitler received Shirill for a private meeting at his home in Munich in late August. This was not an official meeting. They did not meet in a government building, and Shirill did not represent the U.S. government. So, so what? What is Shirill's goal or purpose for writing this, this letter? Here we need to pay special attention to the handwritten section at the end. The fact that it is handwritten is already an important clue, since it suggests that Shirill added details after the main letter was typed. What new information is included about the 1936 Olympic Games? Upon his return to his home in France, Shirill wrote privately to President Roosevelt's secretary, Marguerite Lehand, about the meeting, his impressions of Hitler, and his confidence in Hitler's promise to allow Jewish participation. You can see the reference in the excerpt on your screen. This letter is multiple pages. So for the purposes of this webinar, we took the liberty of highlighting a few quotes. Take a few seconds and read through them. How would you summarize Shirill's overall opinion of Hitler? And what evidence does he provide to support his view? Feel free to type your responses in the Q&A box. So we have a comment, he praises Hitler, either Hitler has him fooled or he's incredibly naive. Well, it, that's an interesting comment because we're looking at this with modern eyes. And to see a letter that has such praise of Hitler seems a little shocking. Because of that, it's a very good reminder to students that this is still early on in the period that we would later call the Holocaust. And many did not yet perceive Hitler as a serious threat. In addition, this is one piece of a larger story, albeit an important one. As a result of Hitler's promise, the IOC voted to hold the games in Germany as planned. What questions do you have that this primary source doesn't answer? What evidence does the writer present that you should fact check or verify is true? What other perspectives should you get? Please keep these questions in mind as we continue our discussion today. So another terrific resource that I want to introduce this evening is Docs Teach. This is the National Archives online tool for teaching with documents. Uh, so we just dropped a link in the chat if you're not familiar with it, so you can um, click through. 
It provides access to thousands of digitized documents and related student activities, including the Sharil analysis that we just completed. Uh, and when you register for a free account, you can save primary sources, browse activities created by other educators, review student responses to Docs Teach activities, and create your own teaching activities. I encourage you to explore the different activities there. Some are designed to help students focus on the details. Others will help students make connections between documents. There's one for sequencing, one for thinking about how documents support different historical interpretations, and more. Some activities will work better shared on a smart board or as a shared screen during a virtual class session. Others may work best assigned to students to complete on their own or in small groups. Oops. So now let's go ahead and dive in and look at more documents together. Different sources reveal a range of perspectives and arguments both for and against an official U.S. boycott of the 1936 Olympic Games. The First Amendment to the Constitution provides citizens with the right to petition the government for redress of grievances. The examples here are exactly that. The first is a letter from a private citizen to the President of the United States, and the second is a letter from a Senator to Secretary of State Cordell Hull, requesting guidance on the federal government's official position so that he could respond to petitions from his constituents about the proposed boycott. Petitions are a great primary source to bring into the classroom because they can help personalize the issues. Looking at different petitions together, whether it's in a gallery walk or other activity, can also give students a chance to analyze arguments. As we consider these two letters, I want you to consider the following questions. What is the author's motivation for writing? When were they made? How does the writer make his case? And what elements of persuasive writing do they employ? So one thing before we go and look at each one individually, I wanna point out here as they're side by side is that you notice that the date for the one on the left is December 9th, 1935. And the date for the second one is January 13th, 1936. So these letters, are really written just only about a month apart. So they're pretty close in timeline to one another. So I know that these are kind of hard to read on the screen, um, but to make it easier for you, we've added some, um, some call out arrows and to kind of highlight some of the pieces that we would hope that you and your students would uh, gather together. So with the first petition, this is correspondence from Senator Augustine Linnergan, um, and so we see here that his motivation for writing is that he had received a telegram from his constituents in Connecticut asking whether he supports the boycott, and he wants to know the official U.S. government stance on this issue. Now, he makes his case here, so he's writing to the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, and he is really establishing his credentials in another in a number of ways. One way is that he is using, we look up at the top here, Senate stationery. It has letterhead that is saying that he is part of the United States Senate. Um, he is calling attention to the reasonableness of his request uh, by employing a calm professional tone in his writing. He also explains that he's writing on the advice of fellow members of the Finance Committee. Um, so suggesting that um, he's not the only one who is wanting to get clarification on this issue. But then he does exert a little peer pressure to um, the Secretary of State. Uh, he says in his letter that he has already replied to his constituents once um, with a statement denouncing, quote, 
all intolerance. And I think that it's important that we note that language there, all intolerance. Uh, and he stresses that a dozen or so American politicians recently had made public statements in support of the boycott. So you can see sort of where he himself is leaning, but he's really wanting to urge the government to make a statement so that he can um, be representing the government's stance in the response to his constituents. The second petition that I want us to look at together here is this one from a private citizen named Aaron Gamzee. Um, and this one he sent directly to President Roosevelt. So he is a private citizen in New York. And his motivation for writing is that he recently read an alarming newspaper report about the situation in Germany. Um, and he wants the United States to boycott the Olympics. So his strategies for trying to persuade the President Roosevelt of his view um, are, and it, we see it in a couple different ways. The first of which is that he attaches that same newspaper article to his letter. He wants President Roosevelt to read it for himself. Um, and when we look at that newspaper article, there's actually a lot of information that is included in there. Um, this newspaper clipping talks about closed borders in Germany, the way that Jewish people are um, being stripped of their passports, that kosher meat is forbidden, certain professions are being closed to them, and and that Jewish people are also enduring harassment and vandalism in Germany. So Gamzee is arguing that U.S. participation in the Olympics undermines the event's spirit of peace and sportsmanship, that it is this diplomatic event where different countries are coming together uh, in a spirit of togetherness. And he even employs some um, harsh emotional language. So he is riled up. Uh, he's saying that the American Olympic Committee chair who traveled to Germany is an idiot for not seeing this or not acting in the way that he um, believes that the United States should. So as this comparison activity demonstrates, there is value to sharing petitions with students to forge that connection to real people in the past, and also to show them examples of how people from the past demonstrated civic responsibility and worked to make a difference in the world. So more advanced students at the high school level, for example, can go even deeper into the public debate by evaluating multiple documents and placing them on a scale, depending on the stance and arguments each presents. By engaging directly with primary sources, students will begin to understand what Americans knew about the Nazi regime's anti-Jewish legislation and the Roosevelt administration's stance about the role of politics in sports. Now, we don't know if uh, President Roosevelt ever replied to Mr. Gamzee, but the archives does have Secretary of State Cordell Hull's response to Senator Lonergan. Um, in this brief one-page letter, Hull explains that the U.S. government is not in charge of deciding whether to send athletes to the Berlin Olympics, but that this responsibility belongs to the American Olympic Committee, a private organization. As such, Hull argues that the federal government should remain silent uh, so that it does not influence the outcome. Questions around sports and politics, and specifically whether the two should mix, is an issue that continues to inspire debate in the present day. What do you think? Let's do one last poll. Maybe we'll give it another minute to see if others would like to participate. So in answering the question whether the government should play a role in deciding whether to send a team, right now, the, um, 
more than 50% have answered yes, but it's fairly closely divided between those who think that the government should play a role and those who think the government should not play a role. So thank you for responding. The United States did send a team to the 1936 Berlin Olympics. While the success of the African-American sprinter Jesse Owens during the games contradicted the Nazi regime's stance of white supremacy, many viewed the Olympics as a huge propaganda win for Germany. The Roosevelt administration remained steadfast in its determination that the Olympics were about sports, not politics. As one possible extension activity, your class can analyze photographs from the 1936 Berlin Olympics and discuss the ways the Nazi regime exploited the event for propaganda purposes. So as you have seen, the National Archives has many records, documents, photographs, films, recordings, and together with the Holocaust Museum's exhibition, Americans and the Holocaust, as well as History Unfolded, provide an excellent primary source, uh, many excellent primary sources for this teaching this topic. Um, we are so pleased that you have joined us for this webinar this evening, which is part of an ongoing partnership between the archives and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, our contact information is included here on the screen. Uh, we hope that you'll stay connected with us and consider joining us again at one of our upcoming events. Uh, we'd now like to open the floor for questions from you. So um, I think at least one question I see already. Um, Cynthia, I am going to direct this one to you. Um, because I know that you did a lot of research um, collaborating with the Roosevelt Presidential Library. So the question is, would it be useful to go to the Roosevelt Presidential Library or the Eisenhower Presidential Library to research the Holocaust? Um, or are the National Archives and the Holocaust Museum the federal sites to go to for research on these topics? Well, that's a good question. And it gives me an opportunity to let people know that the presidential libraries are part of the National Archives um, collection of resources and libraries. The FDR Presidential Library is a great resource. A lot of the records that they hold have been digitized and are easily accessible. Uh, I would also encourage, if you're doing research on the era of the Holocaust, to consider not just the Roosevelt Library, but the Truman Library as well, which offers a tremendous number of original records in digitized format that you can use. All right, so I want to um, now extend this conversation and ask um, our, um, our colleagues over at the Holocaust Museum, um, if you can sort of elaborate a little bit more for us, talking either about the resources, um, archival resources that might be available for research at your museum, but also like let talk to us about other types of teaching resources that are available um, in History Unfolded, um, on the History Unfolded website. So thank you, Brianne. Um, I guess I would answer that question with um, that. Yes, it would be, uh, I think, useful to uh, certainly look at our the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's uh, collections. Uh, we have uh, lots of materials, um, not only on the 1936 Olympic Games and the boycott movement, but on you know, many topics. Um, throughout this entire time period, obviously focused on the Holocaust, but um, we have a lot of materials and an online collection search. Uh, so that would be a great place to start. And um, you don't even necessarily have to leave wherever you're tuned in from as long as you have an internet connection. Uh, the museum does also have a uh, research center, the, um, the uh, Chappelle Research Center uh, is, a really good place for scholars and other researchers if there are materials they can't find 
on the uh, collection search that are available digitized. We're trying to digitize more materials, but um, that would be another place for any serious researcher who's trying to get uh, their hands on you know, either original materials or uh, microfilm materials, other materials. Uh, and then we have a, a library at the museum as well that uh, has some materials. So there's a lot of uh, different uh, options there. I mentioned the Holocaust Encyclopedia. So certainly our museum is going to be a great resource on this uh, topic and other uh, topics of the Holocaust. Uh, when it comes to history unfolded in particular, uh, the website originally started as a um, crowdsourced initiative. Uh, students contributed articles. And we have articles that represent uh, many different types of local newspapers around the United States. A number of the articles are written in other languages besides English. Uh, so we have Spanish language articles, um, Italian and German. And so that's another, you know, really interesting opportunity there. And we have articles uh, from Christian newspapers, labor newspapers. I mentioned the, the Black Press articles. Um, college and university newspapers. The website also uh, includes additional lesson plans, uh, one looking at how young people responded to the events of the Holocaust, in particular college newspapers, and uh, reactions by individuals on college campuses. Uh, one of the other lesson plans looks at a reporting on the uh, MS St. Louis, uh, which was a, a ship um, that had uh, German Jewish refugees and came to the Americas um, and um, was not able to embark uh, the passengers in Cuba and went back to Europe. Uh, we have a lesson plan that looks at how three different Spanish language newspapers reported on those events. And um, so it's fully bilingual as well. And uh, some of the additional teaching resources on the website include a click-through guide of how to read a newspaper from the 1930s and 40s, because we found in creating that History Unfolded project that many students are not familiar with the layout of newspapers from the time period, and that's been a really popular resource. And one of our most recent uh, resources we created is a teaching guide for uh, short activities that teachers can use, uh, introducing uh, either primary source newspaper analysis or comparative analysis or understanding historical context uh, using these newspaper articles from the time period. So I definitely encourage people to check out the website and go to the teaching resources section. Um, for some reason, I don't know why I'm not showing up, but... Um... I am here and I just wanted to add to Eric, um, to what he shared. We have several introductory lesson plans. If you are new to teaching about the Holocaust, we have lesson plans that, that give you a, a great introduction. If you only have one day, we have a lesson plan for that. If you have two to four days, we also have lesson plans for that. We also have um, lesson plans on using diaries, how to use diaries to teach about the Holocaust. We have a guide for literature. We also have a lesson plan that looks at the challenges of finding a place of refuge. And it uses many primary source documents, the documents that you need to come to the United States and documentation that you needed to gather if you wanted to leave Germany. Um, I also um, want to point out that we have interactive timeline activity lesson plans. We have a general timeline activity of the Holocaust. We have a timeline for Anne Frank. We know, you know, Anne Frank is one of the most popular, her diary is one of the most popular texts to use. Um, and I also wanted to mention if you, if you um, are looking for teacher professional development in the summer, we have the Belfer National Conference. This conference is a three-day asynchronous conference that is free and you can watch it at any time um, because it is asynchronous. You have up to six months to watch it. Um, we provide uh, continuing education units. Uh, we're certified, I believe, in all 50 states for some of the territories. And um, 
we will be introducing new resources at the Belfer conference. And um, so, yeah, I think my room is too dark. It got very dark in here. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I apologize that you cannot see me, but um, we will share that information to send the link to the Belfer National Conference for you to um, take part in it if you're looking for more teacher professional development. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I think, you know, one thing that I want to highlight before we uh, close out our conversation for tonight, um, this evening we really focused on the 1936 Berlin Olympics, but um, obviously the exhibit that we um, were pairing archives documents and the Holocaust Museum um, is Americans and the Holocaust. So can you just speak briefly about what other topics are covered in that exhibit? Well, if, if you all don't mind uh, not seeing me, um, yes, absolutely. We look at immigration. Immigration is a huge theme. Um, we mentioned the lesson plan, it's called Challenges of Escape. Um, we also have um, the animated video series. It's called Behind Every Name. So the Gretel Bergman story is included in there. But we also look at four other stories of other individuals who are trying to come to the United States, including uh, Anne Frank's family and the primary source documents that go along with their story. We also look at the debates to enter the war. Should we enter the war or not? And of course, that debate ends on December 7th of 1941. Um, and we also look at the United States responses, governmental responses as well. Um, if you Google Americans in the Holocaust, it'll take you to the web page that we have on the initiative. And at the side, you will see the teacher resources and lesson plans that we have that go with it. Wonderful. Thanks so much. For the archive side of things, I just want to give another plug for um, Docs Teach, our online tool for teaching with primary source documents. We do have on our popular topics page links for World War II, and underneath that we do have the Holocaust. Um, and we also have a section for sports, which is where some of our Olympics things are housed. Uh, but we have activities and primary source documents there connected to what we showed you this evening. Um, we also previously have have um, partnered on a webinar about um, immigration and refugee issues uh, connected to the Holocaust. So you can be sure to check those out there on Docs Teach. Um, we at the National Archives have some summer institutes coming up. Um, we have one that is uh, in connection with the National Portrait Gallery that is teaching with primary sources and portraiture that'll be coming up in late July. Um, but you can always stay connected with us through our quarterly education newsletter and see what's on. Um, so with that, I want to give a sincere thanks to um, Eric and Christina from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum for uh, sharing their resources and knowledge with us tonight. Um, to my colleague, Cynthia, uh, for uh, co-presenting about National Archives, and to all of you for giving up part of your Thursday evening to join us and discuss this important topic. Uh, so thank you very much and good evening.